This past year, the entire HVAC industry went through a massive upset. Much of the existing HVAC equipment had to be redesigned from the ground up. There are huge price increases starting off 2023. Many product lines were on back order for months, and customers couldn't get the products that they wanted. Even some contractors went out of business due to all these major changes. You might be asking, what caused all these changes? Well, simply put, SEER 2. In this video, I'm going to touch on the SEER 2 government mandates, along with all the challenges that the HVAC industry just went through and is still going through in order to pull off the SEER 2 requirements. Hi, this is Kenneth with Atlas AC, and at any point during this video, if you find it to be interesting, please hit the like button. That will really help me out with the YouTube algorithms. You might be asking yourself, what even is SEER 2? This is a confusing subject, much like most things that the government has their hands in, but I'm going to try to keep it as simple as possible. Let's first start off with SEER, and then after that, we're going to jump over to SEER 2. SEER stands for Seasonal Energy Efficiency Ratio. So basically what's being done here is they're taking the entire cooling season that an AC system is going to experience throughout the year. From there, they look at the energy consumption of that unit. They then divide it out to get an average, and that average is going to be SEER. And the higher the SEER rating, the more energy efficient the system is. If we look at this chart here, it shows us the minimum efficiency standards for heat pump and air conditioning systems. Since I'm located in Texas, I'm going to be focusing on the southern region. And please note that the northern region does have slightly different requirements for SEER. So you can see in this chart that the Department of Energy has been increasing the minimum SEER requirements for a while now. In 2006, they went from 10 SEER systems all the way up to 13 SEER systems. Fast forward to 2015, there was another jump up from 13 to 14 SEER. And in 2023, there's another jump from 14 to 15 SEER. You might be saying to yourself, what makes 2023 so special? Because we've clearly increased SEER ratings several times in the past. So the short answer is, is we not only had to go up in SEER, but there was a change made to how SEER was being calculated. And the change falls under the new M1 testing procedures. And the major changes has to do with external static pressure. And in the old SEER test, all they had to test for is a 0.1 external static pressure. Now they're bumping it up to a 0.5 external static pressure. So basically what this means is at a 0.1 external static pressure, that is not accounting for ductwork. Then once we bump it up to a 0.5 external static pressure, now we're starting to include some of the ductwork. So by making these changes, this is going to give us a better idea of what to expect in energy savings in a more real world application. There were also some other changes made. However, this was the big one. So let's take a look at how SEER 2 changed the way that SEER is being measured. This guide was put together by Carrier back in March of 2022. And as a cool side note, Heidi here is actually a product expert at Carrier. Earlier this year, I did a podcast with her. So if you're interested in learning more about Carrier, go ahead and check out that podcast. So if we scroll down to the next page, we can see a SEER map, and this should help clarify a couple things. And again, since I'm located in Texas, we're going to be looking at the southeast region. So you can see there are three columns here. Uh, this one here has the previous SEER rating that we used to follow. Here's the new SEER rating without the M1 test. This one is including the M1 test, making it the SEER 2 standards. So if we look over here, there's two different rows. The first row is showing that anything under 45,000 BTUs, which 45,000 BTUs is 3.75 tons. So, you know, essentially anything under three and a half tons um, is going to follow this row. Anything over four tons is going to be following this SEER requirement. So as you can see here, we used to be at 14 SEER, now we're jumping to 15 SEER. And under the new testing standards for SEER 2, it actually drops it back down to 14.3 SEER. And for systems that are four tons and larger, you can see that it used to be 14 SEER, now they're bumping it up to 14.5 SEER. And then under the new SEER 2 requirements, it's actually 13.8 SEER. Another question you might be having is, why are they splitting up SEER requirements based on the size of the system? So a good analogy would be, let's say we're dealing with a two-ton heat pump. Well, that would be equivalent to a small car. So it's just a lot easier to get good gas mileage out of something like a Toyota Prius. 
versus dealing with, let's say, a five-ton heat pump, then the question becomes, how do you get good gas mileage out of a bus? You might be scratching your head about this row right here. The old SEER was 14 SEER, and the new SEER 2 is 13.8 SEER. Why is that? So the answer is, is we really got to go back to the ductwork. Once you factor in the ductwork, the system's going to be working a lot harder in order to uh, keep up, meaning it's going to be using more energy. So if you took the old equipment and ran it through the SEER 2 test, it would be far underneath this number here at 13.8. So one of the best ways to look at SEER moving forward is the industry pretty much no longer works off of the old standard of how SEER was tested. We've pretty much all moved over to the new SEER 2 standard. So basically, the cat's out of the bag and these old SEER standards are pointless to work off of. It's best to only work off of the newer SEER 2 standards. Now that that's out of the way, let's get back on track and talk about how SEER 2 had such a major impact on the HVAC industry. So before 2023, systems were not designed around being tested at that 0.5 external static pressure, which would better represent the ductwork. By adding this to the test, it became clear that the old equipment was not going to meet the requirements for the new SEER 2 testing standards. Because of this, many entry-level and mid-tier product lines had to be redesigned from the ground up. So now the equipment has to get even more energy efficient to meet the new guidelines. So what are some ways that manufacturers use to make their equipment more energy efficient? So one way to help is to increase the evaporator coil size and the condensing coil size. This gives the system a lot more surface area to exchange the heat, making it more efficient. You can also use multi-speed or variable speed blower motors in order to reduce the amp draws on startup. And the compressor could be upgraded to a two-stage compressor to do the same thing. There's also a lot of other little things you can do, but these are going to have the largest impact. So what did manufacturers do to tackle this problem? Well, the answer is all of the above. So the evaporator coils got bigger, along with the condensers, they also got bigger. They upgraded the blower motors to be more energy efficient. Some manufacturers had to go as far as upgrading their four and five ton base model single stage systems to a two stage compressor. And again, there were also a lot of other changes that were made to help increase efficiency. Also, each manufacturer took a different approach to this redesign process. Some manufacturers didn't put that much emphasis on the size of the equipment increasing, and some manufacturers like Carrier put a lot of emphasis on it. Both of these are identical systems just made by different manufacturers. You can see the one on the left is made by Goodman, the one on the right made by Carrier. They both have four ton air conditioners with a gas furnace. You can see the evaporator coil is far smaller on the Carrier, along with the condenser being far smaller. The Goodman is 14.3 SEER, while the Carrier is actually 15.2 SEER. So Carrier designed their condensers to have the smallest footprint possible while keeping it as energy efficient as possible. They also came out with a new evaporator coil to help with sizing as well, which really is a big help when it comes to installing the equipment. And some manufacturers included some adjustments to the equipment so it would meet the new Freon standards coming out in 2025. And that's right, we're not out of the woods yet. We have more changes coming. Now let's look at some of the supply chain issues that occur when you roll out a bunch of new product lines. A good way to look at an HVAC manufacturer is it's not a singular company that's putting together all the parts and pieces all by itself. There are also other partners and manufacturers that are involved in this process that help deliver on, you know, parts, pieces, and other components that might be going into these systems. So you can have other sub-manufacturers build the compressors and blower motors and fan motors and control boards and so on. So when the new HVAC equipment was designed to meet the new SEER 2 standards, there was a trickle-down effect. So all these sub-manufacturers also had to follow the redesign standards for SEER 2. But so did all the sub-manufacturers have to retool their factories as well. You can go quite a bit deeper than that in the supply chain. I mean, you can go as far as, you know, the mining companies providing the aluminum for the coils. However, the majority of changes happened at these two levels because... For the mining company, it was business as usual. So you can see that there's a lot of other parties that's involved in this process, and it only takes one to not deliver in time to hold up everything. 
Just like back in the COVID days when we heard reports of Ford having thousands of vehicles parked that were completely finished, just waiting on some chips and control boards in order to roll out. It's exactly the same thing here. So if a sub manufacturer is having a hard time getting a blower motor out, then product doesn't ship. And there could be other issues that contribute to product delays, things like a certain SKU not able to pass the CR2 test, so adjustments had to get made, so it slowed down the start time of when that product could get manufactured. And since we are dealing with all new product lines, at the distributor level, the purchasing manager might have forecasted the wrong products to inventory. So you can see that there's a lot going on in regards to the CR2 impacts on the supply chain. And I will say that there were a lot of product shortages throughout the year. And some brands manage this process far better than others. For example, we had a distributor come into our office about two weeks ago, which would be the, the end of August. And they sell a brand that we don't push here at Atlas. We do buy a lot of supplies from them, just not equipment. And they told us that they finally got their shipment of equipment in that they were supposed to receive at the beginning of summer. And I about fell out of my chair. Because what that means is, is the contractors that sell that brand couldn't. And not only that, they're stuck with all this extra inventory that's going to be left on their books for the rest of the year. And it wasn't their fault. There was just a breakdown somewhere. A less extreme example of this would be, for about two months during the summer, I was not able to get my hands on a four-ton, two-stage AC unit from Carrier. And lucky enough for us, we do so much volume with them that they upgraded us to a variable speed infinity system. So there are some lucky customers out there that got upgraded to an infinity system with no extra charge. The transition was traumatic enough where many manufacturers put their commercial equipment on the back burner and focused mostly on residential equipment, which then extended the lead times on commercial equipment up to as much as six months. As bad for business as this was, they just simply had to do it to keep up with all the changes. Now let's look at how contractors and customers were affected when it comes to the installation of this new SEER 2 equipment. So if we go back to before 2006, in the era of 10 SEER equipment, Builders were designing and building homes for smaller equipment. The closets were a lot smaller for furnaces or air handlers, along with the attic ladders being smaller as well. And systems were able to be installed in tight areas. Let's say in a closet, uh, there was a lot of scenarios where we had to remove the door jam in order to get the equipment to fit. In some cases, we had to get a handyman to enlarge the door frame altogether. And the same thing goes for systems that are located in an attic. Sometimes we would have to pull the entire ladder, and even in some cases, cut completely new scuttle holes in order to get the equipment to the attic. And in some of the most extreme cases, we would have to relocate the indoor unit altogether. There could also be issues reusing the plenums because the size of the system got larger. Earlier I mentioned how Carrier redesigned their coils to help keep the footprint of their equipment as small as possible. Because of this, we do have fewer issues installing a Carrier over other brands. However, their equipment still did grow in size some. In regards to condensers, if they get too wide, they can no longer fit through the fence gates, and we would have to remove fence paneling in order to get the condenser to the backyard. So for many homes, gone are the days of straightforward, simple changeouts. And this ends up adding a lot of burden to the install teams that we once did not have. If you made it to the end of the video, you've probably figured out by now why CR2 equipment is just going to be more expensive than the old stuff. There was engineering, designing, all the equipment had to be retested for CR2, factories had to be retooled for the changes, products grew in size and the components all had to get more efficient, and installs became more difficult. And this is partially why HVAC costs have gotten where they are. That being said, if you're thinking about replacing your AC system, you might want to check out our price list where you're getting pricing from an actual HVAC company. You can even check out our shopping cart where you can build your own system, along with our buyer's guide to make sure you get exactly what you need. Until next time, have a good one.